basically considered to belong to so-called Bosnian church, the church that was starting to establish itself uh, as a close to both Catholic and Orthodox at the same time. So it was a presentation of soft uh, communism. It was showing to what extent the state is accepting different religions, cultural differences, but at the same time, it culturalized religions. Then these works that were made for religious purposes became cultural artifacts that every child in Yugoslavia had to know. And this exhibition was a huge success. Here on the right upper side, you see the, the one journal, Wikin Palace, with the Trogir Cathedral sculpture on the front page. Andre Mauro, who was not yet Minister of Culture, made a huge text about uh, spirituality and excellence of those artworks that should belong to Le Musée Imaginaire, Imaginary Museum, and so on. But very quickly, after obtaining those recognition of the West, Tito turned himself to the decolonizing world, the world that started to decolonize itself, to their leaders. And here you see the famous photograph from 1960 in New York, where Tito was acting as a host, regrouping these five people to start speaking about non-aligned movement, about presence, and you can see all most important uh, leaders of uh, uh, Ghana, Nehru, Kwame Nekrumah of Ghana, Gamal Abdel Nasser of, uh, in that time it was still United Arab Republic because Egypt and Syria has been one state in that moment. Sukarno, who is going to be overturned relatively soon afterwards from Indonesia, and Tito. And that's just show to what extent Tito and Yugoslavia was committed to help creation of the movement who will have a word to say on global scene. And if you look this first Belgrade conference participants from 1961, you are going to see uh, the leaders of in that moment states that were states of hope, promising. I put deliberately maps of three states that participated in the first conference of non-aligned countries, Cyprus, Lebanon, Mali. Uh, the people really in Mali last year when I presented this nearly cried what happened to their country from this moment of hope that was done by this huge movement till today, where you can see the uh, nearly four fifths of the country is in a red color, mean, not safe, non securitized, and so on. What happened to Cyprus, which is still divided country? What's happened to Lebanon, and so on? It's not, you might think now, why I'm speaking that, what that has to do. I want to say that, unfortunately, both Eastern and Western Bloc had did everything to destabilize non-aligned countries. It started with Cambodia, where Americans directly said to Sihanouk, the king, you should not ally to non-alignment movement. You should be our ally in the fight against North Vietnam. Sihanouk refused and the civil war supported by Americans on one side and Chinese on the others started, which still today is a heavy burden on this country. In Mali, it was Soviet Union that interfered and replaced this uh, uh, Modibo Keita, who was the first leader of the colonized country, because they wanted also to persuade non-aligned country to go more eastwards. So none of the forces has been Turkey as a NATO member or so influenced and 
attacked independence of Cyprus as a joint republic using certain, uh, really, we have to acknowledge that terrorist attack of Turkish uh, minority population feeling oppressed against Greeks. So then it was uh, uh, Greeks that revenge and then the Turkish army revenge. So not to go much in the history, uh, the question that I was posing myself is, had a non-alignment movement embedded a cultural diplomacy and so on? In fact, at the beginning, it was not really the case debated. During first travels of Tito to Africa, culture was not an important issue on the agenda. Yugoslavian presence were related to technical engineering and the concept of modernization, while African countries responded with their tangible and intangible heritage because they didn't have yet anything else to offer. And also they wanted to reinforce their cultural identity. My paper, not today, but because we don't have time, is going really to focus on the beginnings of cultural diplomacy as a bottom-up cultural diplomacy raised by cultural actors in Yugoslavia, seeing that official structures of cultural of diplomacy are not really thinking much about it. So BTEF was really created as idea of bridging East and West and the third world non-aligned. And we can see that in this period of the uh, rays of the non-aligned movement, a lot of uh, contemporary art, cutting edge, international festivals has been created. First Music Biennial in Zagreb, then Bitter in Belgrade, Bemus Fest, uh, and so on. So this paper will explore to what extent festivals and other cultural collaboration projects will enable cultural transfers and uh, making some holes in this iron curtain that uh, existed. So we all, I also want to explore what kind of cultural transfers and in which forms are happening, official visits, cultural events, uh, building new administrative centers in Africa, in Nigeria, for example, in Kone or in the uh, Harare, in Zimbabwe and so on. So, and who is keeping memory and legacy of all that? Um, we have identified only several institutions and there are going to be case studies. But here you see, for example, who were the architects of non-alignment conference uh, in Belgrade, the, our main politician of that time, but culture was not in the agenda. So, at the same time, we can say that everything that belongs to socialist Yugoslavia today in present political circumstances uh, is in fact, uh, I'm just asked to unmute myself, but I know I can't, shouldn't do that. So uh, uh, in this sense, it's very difficult to keep a heritage and legacy of non-aligned movement if we should not keep anything as a positive from Yugoslavia, from being accused of Yugo-nostalgic, communist, this and that. How difficult it is for the institution really to keep those legacy alive. So I would say that cultural implications of non-aligned movements during Cold War are much bigger than they are written and explored and mentioned in history. Um, our painter, uh, Petar Lubarda, he was the one that grew up together with the socialist Yugoslavia and this non-aligned movement impacted her career path largely. He was the first representative at Sao Paulo Biennial of Yugoslavia. He was then invited to India and uh, he himself said that all these travels 
returned, that he returned as a different man. So, but we, then we look, what are really legacy of non-alignment today? What are narratives? Narratives, places, monuments, how one legacy is kept? What are the leaders, how they are described? That's probably even the most, uh, I would say, positive. Nehru, even Nasser, is today kept with a certain respect in Egypt. Narrative of nostalgia, as everything was better once upon a time, is not narrative that is going to bring benefit to anything, but narrativization of lieu de memoir, spaces of memory, can be something that can be extremely important in public life. So yes, in this, how we celebrated 50 years of non-aligned movement, we had 105 delegations. You might say, wow, in 1961, that was in uh, 2011, when we organized the summit as the first non member state because we were expelled with the split of Yugoslavia from non-aligned movement. But our ministry said, we are not going to change our role of observer. And uh, what he underlined as opportunities of this conference, strengthening bilateral relations with countries that are not going to support independence of Kosovo, opportunity to strengthen economic and trade relations, full stop. This collaboration will not hurt your integration processes. You see, culture is not that. Did something change for the 60 year of non-aligned movement? I have to say, yes, not on the state level, not on the state politics, state politics stayed the same, but museums of Africa now, Museum of Yugoslavia, Institute for Cultural Development, who was extremely engaged in 70s and 80s to develop uh, uh, staff, cultural developers, uh, cultural animators, and the documentaries of cultural policy of non-aligned countries. They all prepared exhibitions, prepared talks, discussions, and so on. Museum of African Art prepared remnants of the Lieu de Memoir. Museum of Yugoslavia was focusing more on arts, but I will probably and I will finish with that because we don't have time, just show you on the examples of sites of memories, how memory of non-alignment has disappeared. One of the most important uh, things in that way was the park of friendship. It is a park uh, across the center of Belgrade, in New Belgrade, where each of the leaders of this uh, first conference of non-aligned country has planted a sycamore a tree in 1961. However, a few years after that, they realized they have to make an uh, urbanistic plan for all this area. And it was all Yugoslav competition won by architect and professor of this university, Palishashki. Uh, this gesture soon became a model. So after that, it, because it was not announced as part of non-aligned friendship, it was just friendship, Queen Elizabeth was also planting the tree, Gerald Ford, Brezhnev, Margaret Thatcher, finally it ended up with Rolling Stones, and most recently, Josipovic, the president of Croatia, planted a Siberian elm. Unfortunately, due to climate changes and so on, most of those trees vanished. This urbanistic plan done in 65 by Palishashki was never implemented because in fact, in this um, second, uh, for this conference, two things has been envisaged, park of friendship. And the second was to put three obelisks in the Belgrade. Two had been done, had been raised. Only one survived till today. Uh, the third one was never raised. 
This one on the square of the Marx and Engels in that time was meant to be temporary and it was erased. The second one near Branco Bridge uh, stayed and is re renewed every time when there is some conference in Belgrade. Once it was by youth of Yazas, uh, the, the youth that is fight against uh, uh, AIDS and other diseases uh, was covered and uh, the people thought it's so inappropriate. And because it's a monument to non-aligned movement, it's a monument to something that should be sacred. You cannot put such a kind of, uh, um, how would say, raising awareness that you should use all preventive measures to prevent spread of sexual diseases on this, uh, on this monument. But the third one, which was supposed to be done in this part of friendship, that you can see the picture, was never realized. Palishashki then said, probably it's not a good idea, uh, obelisk, he proposed a, a, square, a sphere, but that one was not also realized. Immediately after bombardment in 1999, on the suggestion of Miljana Markovic, in that moment leader of one extreme left political party, Yule, the monument uh, uh, was etern called Eternal Flame, was raised to memorize victims of NATO bombardment. Because it was initiated by those that people were held responsible for NATO bombardment. And because it was put in this part of friendship, most of the citizens of that way thought it's inappropriate and the monument was always vandalized and always was, as you can see in the photo, kind of empty. Now it is cleaned, but however, it's empty of any meaning. Murals for 89 conference that are still there are because in 89, murals were done to embellish for the non-aligned summit conference, Belgrade, different cities have given presents to Belgrade, like city of Sarajevo gave this uh, um, Fountain in the which is now in Skadarlia, and uh, Banat was giving this uh, Banat fountain, which is still today in Topichin Banat, which all of them is forgotten as a legacy of non aligned movement. Anyway, this legacy exists throughout the world, and with that, I'm going to finish, although unfortunately the movement do not have any real importance today. The monuments in Mexico to President Tito that was built there immediately after he died was just showing what unaligned countries of Latin America thought about Tito and non-aligned movement. Congress Center Sheraton, our architects Draguli and Navakic were invited to the project and it was hosting eighth summit of non-aligned movement. Here you see in Phnom Penh, the street of Yossi Bros Tito, this is on the right hand side, and on the left, the street of Yugoslavia. Here you see the banknote of Guinea. Countries of non-aligned movement wanted to give homage to uh, those leaders that helped uh, non-aligned movement to uh, give them self-confidence and to regain some values. Here I went quickly through artworks uh, that uh, in the different ways are related. Just to make a short conclusion, cultural transfers, although used to be intensive, were never codified, theoretized, written. So you can't find a book culture of non-aligned countries or cultural cooperation and so on. It's only recently that people in India, for example, and Africa are starting to explore mutual relations that have started in, uh, and unfortunately, not at their own universities, but at University of Munich, who fundraised and found uh, support for Indian and African researcher and us 
to make a um, contribution on this respect. In our case, the problem is that there was no political will today for that. While in 60s and 70s, to be very honest, speaking with many architects and historians of art, there was no will among the leaders of cultural institutions who wanted more to collaborate with the West, with those cultural institutions that are, I would say, giving our norms, key museums, key theaters, and so on. However, since, as I said, 10 years, the real research started, and this is one of the publication of Museum of Yugoslavia, edited by Rodina Vucetic and Paul Betts, about Tito in Africa, only done research through pictures, and they name it, I think, very nicely, picturing solidarity. And I would think that's the key issue of the non-aligned movement that was existing then, unfortunately, due to different economic more than military pressures and so on, there is no that much solidarity in this movement today. Uh, thank you very much. I will close now my PowerPoint. And uh, all debates for all participants are going to be held when we all finish uh, the presentation. So now, according to schedule, it's a time for Ivana Vesic from Institute of Musicology uh, of Serbian Academy of Science and Arts the place of popular music in public diplomacy, experiences of countries of former Western and Eastern Bloc, and Serbian challenges. Even though Vesic holds a PhD in sociology and MA in sociology and musicology, uh, her research is focused on the socio-historical dimensions of art and popular music practices in Serbia and Yugoslavia from the 1850s to the early 21st century, with the emphasis on the issues of music taste and consumption, music and politics, music and cultural policies, etc. She published two books in cooperation with Dr. Vesna Sarapeno and more than 30 articles and book chapters in scientific journals and collective uh, volumes. She has co-edited two collective volumes on which was dedicated to the topic of music and diplomacy, the tunes of diplomatic notes, music and diplomacy in Southeast uh, Europe, and uh, reminding us what uh, Emil Brix said in his first speech. Let's hear now, even would she contradict his words that classical music is not, or she's maybe confirming because she's also focusing on some other types of music. Please, uh, even uh, take a floor. Uh, thank you, Professor Šešić. Uh, well, I'll first try to share my screen to see if it's working. Just a moment. Um, okay, so here it is. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, do you see uh, my, my screen? Is it uh, fine to you? No. Um, okay. We see the screen. We see the presentation. You see? Yes. We yes. See. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. So oh, the, yeah. I don't see. So I'm going to. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah in the large uh, screen uh, behind I had, you. I had the problem with my own computer. Uh -huh, okay. Okay. It's so connecting, it's... but we see it now. Yes. Oh, okay. I hope I hope you will be able to see it. So. Oh, yeah. uh, I see it on the big screen. Yeah, on the bigger screen. Yes, yes. I also see it there. Okay, so I'll start. I try to be very fast because uh, I have to squeeze so many uh, information into 15 or, or 20 minutes. Uh, so the interest for the use of different types of music in international relations has been in constant rise in the past 20 years among the researchers from various disciplines and parts of the world. 
dozens of important studies and collective volumes have appeared uh, on that topic during this period with American scholars, mostly from the field of political and cultural history, taking the dominant position and steering the explora uh, explorations in several important directions. Uh, therefore, it's not surprising that the main focus was put on the Cold War era, given the relevance uh, that cultural diplomacy and along with it musical diplomacy gained as a part of the US statecraft soon after the Second World War. Competitive political uh, relations between two opposing sides at the time, the Western and Eastern Bloc, among other things, pushed the cultural promotion into the forefront of international relations. As a result, state administrations, funds and cultural resources of many countries were carefully and systematically exploited for the first time in modern history in order to reshape their identity abroad, to change popular beliefs uh, and strengthen their political and economic standing. Although similar tendencies were anticipated in interwar period and their germs could be noticed since the second half of the 19th century, the level of planning and strategical instrumentalization of cultural production reached during the Cold War on both sides and beyond was by far unprecedented. Uh, that exactly explains persistent attention that researchers are giving to this period and its numerous phases, intricacies, actors and projects, as well as its uh, centrality and significance. Despite its status in the explorations of cultural diplomacy, including uh, musical diplomacy, Cold War era puzzles uh, is far from being solved. The new data and interpretations that keep emerging on this topic just point to its multiple layers, controversies and complexities as new countries, regions, governments and strategies are taken into consideration. Besides the importance of interconnections between national and international cultural policy and the interfering of global and regional music industry with the process of branding of specific countries that began to manifest themselves in the scrutinizing of Cold War, cultural diplomacy actions could possibly uncover a large set of previously unexplored phenomena. It is this particular characteristic of studying cultural diplomacy that has attracted attention of a group of researchers from the former Yugoslavia, including me and my colleagues from the Institute of Musicology of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, and has prompted us to initiate a series of explorations in the past four years in order to carry the subfield of musical diplomacy off the margins. Most of the data and insights that I shall point out today evolved from these research undertakings. What needs to be stressed is that this area is in it, still in, in its initial stage of development and that only tiny fragments of the process of international cultural policy creation in this part of Europe are revealed. Further exploring of both international and national cultural policy of the Serbian and Yugoslav states, primarily the very rich but modestly tackled history of socialist Yugoslavia's cultural production and exchange, as well as music industry, is needed in order to better clarify some of the phenomena I'll underline uh, in today's presentation. Uh, my main aim is to uncover some of the most characteristic dimensions of international cultural policy, making it a Cold War and post-Cold War period, focusing on the ways popular music genres were approached by governments from Western and Eastern blocs, as well as those of the so-called First and Second World. Uh, second worlds. In the first place, I will discuss the relevance of diverse types of popular music in the cultural diplomacy of US in different stages during the Cold War, as well as in the post-1989 uh, times. Uh, special emphasis will be given to explaining the possible reasons behind a change of selected genres in order to demonstrate a range of different outcomes of using popular music as a tool for cultural diplomacy, the case of American rock band Blood, Sweat and Tears and its tour in the countries behind the uh, Iron Curtain in 1970 will be thoroughly examined. After describing the shifts in post-1989 approach to music in US cultural diplomacy, I will proceed to outlining the socialist Yugoslavia and post-socialist Serbian perspectives towards the use of popular music in international cultural relations. The priority is to point to the problem of popular music's constantly changing status in cultural production and its unstable subdivisions into more or less prestigious practices and how it affects its uses in cultural diplomacy. Um, if the golden era of U.S. cultural diplomacy is considered, there is no doubt that it was uh, for the most part fueled by the USSR activities around the globe in the early 1950s. 
interpreting Soviet cultural propaganda as sophisticated means to attract non-aligned countries, both to its political and social models and political alliances, U.S. State Department responded promptly by launching a thoroughly prepared culture presentations program in 1954. Aside from providing stable and at times lavishing funding, the State Department assigned the realization of this program to the network of state and independent bodies and councils, as well as to the personnel of the U.S. embassies around the world that had a very responsible role in coordinating activities with local institutions, media, sponsors, etc among others. State Department engaged a private organization, an American uh, National Theater and Academy, ANTA, for that purpose, and it organized advisory panels of experts in music and other arts that evaluated candidates for tours that uh, held monthly meetings. Uh, the first breakthrough of the cultural presentations program came in the second half of the 1950s, owing to the change of programming, which was by that time almost exclusively dedicated to classical music. Instead of opting for what French social sociologist Pierre Bourdieu calls the uh, products of legitimate culture, in this case, uh, the high art music, there, was, uh, there were voices sorry, that supported uh, the diversification of programming, particularly concerning the inclusion of the established jazz performance and bands. After the initial experimentation with jazz music that encompassed the touring of Adizzi Gillespie's band in 1956, gained a lot of affirmative comments and positive reactions both from state administration, media, and audience abroad, jazz musicians and ensembles started to regularly participate in the CBP and became, became one of its trademarks. As a result, a separate panel for evaluation of jazz and folk music was established in 1964 inside ANTA. Regarding the use of jazz in the US culture diplomacy from the late 1950s and throughout uh, the 1960s, several important insights should be pointed uh, to. Given the list of musicians and bands that were selected for tours, the emphasis was put on the acclaimed performance of pre um, Second World War and uh, Second World War uh, swing jazz. Uh, that's the first straw. Uh, while more experimental artists of the late 1950s and early 1960s were rarely engaged in the second row of uh, artists. Uh, this was probably the result of the assessment that uh, most of the audience in foreign countries were not familiar with the later stages of jazz production and that they needed first to be introduced to the various historical styles of jazz in order to learn how to appreciate this type of music which was, according to reports of U.S. embassies around the world, proved wrong in many cases. Although uh, inclusion of jazz in the CPP primarily served to contradict Soviet propaganda based on a number of proofs of deeply ingrained uh, racism in American society, as well as the oppression of African Americans, it actually had broader outcomes. Most importantly, this enabled the gradual institu uh, institutionalization of jazz music, its legitimizing and making it part of uh, the American genuine artistic products. This is just one of the manifestations of possible interconnection and intertwining of international and national cultural policy, particularly on the effects of cultural diplomatic actions and narratives on the cultural uh, hierarchy in the national framework. Many others, for instance, whether worldwide jazz tours had any impact on reinforcing the polarizations of African-American community or on the anti-government white youth circles, were unfortunately not tackled in detail in previous research. Similarly, with jazz tours, the broadening of music selection in the late 1960s in the process of further fine-tuning of U.S. cultural diplomacy brought to the fore the correlations between international cultural policy making, structuring of political and uh, cultural fields, socio-political inequalities, and many other phenomena. <laughs> The most important step in this respect uh, represented a focusing on the most popular sound at the time among the American youth, the rock music. Although exporting jazz behind the Iron Curtain was understood by certain researchers as a means of encouraging its youth to trigger socio-political changes, the fact that by the early 1960s, many of the countries of the Eastern Bloc uh, had developed very dynamic jazz scenes, including the respectable number of talent, talented musicians and ensembles, festival critics, professional magazines, and connoisseurs, and that this type of music mostly attracted the urban, well-educated middle class and middle-aged population doomed this process to failure. Still, 
could the more raw and energetic sound of young American rock musicians filled with rebellious sparks and transformative power make any difference? According to media coverage, testimonies of musicians, as well as the reports of US embassies and State Department's personnel of the first rock tour organized in 1970, this was a possibility that couldn't be easily dismissed. But it was not the only aim the cultural diplomacy makers were hoping for. Knowing how critical rock musicians were of American society and politics and how they tended to openly express their discontent, the decision to support a rock band tour, especially in the Eastern Bloc, probably stemmed from the belief in its potential to show to the communist world the image of a genuine democracy where differences were not only tolerated but also cultivated and respected. For this purpose, an established and high-rated jazz rock band, Blood, Sweat and Tears, was chosen and despite harsh criticism from various circles, the whole project was strongly supported by the authorities. The band performed in urban centers of Poland, Yugoslavia and Romania in June and July of 1970 in front of more than 50,000 young spectators and the whole tour was filmed. Unfortunately, parts of the dozens of hours of video material were made available only recently, <laughs> owing to the re release of a documentary, um, when, uh, what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears. Uh, this historical and unprecedented tour was evaluated as an a project and a very large success for the United States and the State Department. Apart from accomplishing some of the projected goals, uh, to counter the communist propaganda, to attract a lot of young spectators from selected uh, Eastern European countries, to create a great impression on them as well as on the local media, it also stirred up certain unexpected effects. Before all, it should uh, be noted that band members returned to US disappointed with what they saw, particularly in Romania, and they took every chance to talk about their disenchantment regarding the communist world. It seems that the brutality of Romanian police towards uh, the youth during concerts, as well as the atmosphere of absolute fear and repression in this country, left American musicians completely shocked, which they emphasized in interviews for the most popular dailies and magazines. Therefore, it is not surprising that William Buckley, a member of the USIA Advisory Commission on Information, concluded the following, I quote, we did have a smashing success with the Black Sweat and Tears group. Whether they converted more Romanians or whether Romanians affected them, it is hard to say. It is rumored that some of the members of Blood, Sweat and Tears having come back from East Europe are actually more appreciative of America than they were when they left. So it may be that the particular activity will have primarily a beneficial effect domestically, end of quote. The case of Blood, Sweat and Tears and the aftermath of their Eastern European tour points uh, in a specific way to the multiple interconnections between culture diplomacy and structuring of the national cultural sphere. Parallel to musicians' revelations to the public concerning their misconceptions about communism, or as the singer David Clayton Thomas sincerely put it, I quote, we went over there with the idea of just how much so-called communist fascism is American propaganda. And I found that the propaganda is pretty damn close to the truth. It's scary. Um, there was campaigning against them from the far left circuits in the US because of collaboration with the government. Although it's hard to estimate whether Ben's interviewing had any influence on the reception of communism and Eastern Bloc among the American youth, it is undoubtful that their decision to participate in the, the, the State Department's program and to contribute to American propaganda behind the Iron Curtain took a toll on their reputation and eventually led to serious decline of support among their fans and generally the American youth. In the 1970s, funding of the U.S. cultural activities abroad was reduced, and almost a decade after the dissolution of uh, the USSR uh, and uh, the U.S. Informative uh, Information Agency, USIA, which had conducted public diplomacy since 1953, had, was dismantled, and its activities scattered throughout the State Department. The renewal of interest for using of cultural resources in U.S. international relations was displayed after 9-11 attacks. It was hip-hop that mostly gained support uh, of the authorities. 
This time, the emphasis was on small-scale events, the collaboration between foreign and American DJs, MCs, and on the potential of hip-hop to empower various social groups uh, in the host countries. Aside from that, uh, as some American scholars noticed, the Next Level program brought up the issue of commercialization of the genre, its internal polarization determined by the level of social engagement and uh, musical innovation, but also the effectiveness of cultural diplomacy in the face of general rising of anti-American sentiments worldwide. Or as Martha Bale stated, I quote, given the hostility felt towards America in many parts of the world, it seems unlikely that even the most carefully crafted musical diplomacy would help very much, end of quote. <laughs> In order to finish off this presentation, I'd like to highlight uh, the most important aspects of socialist Yugoslavia and uh, post-socialist Serbia cultural diplomacy, focusing on the role of popular music genres. After its political distancing from the USSR and Eastern Bloc that was initiated in 1948, socialist Yugoslavia developed dynamic cultural exchange with large number of countries, mainly from the Western Bloc, but after 1955 also from the Eastern Bloc and the non-aligned countries that served to promote its advancements in the sphere of high art music and the virtuosity of its uh, amateur artists and troops. Very early on uh, in this process, in the 1960s, the creators of Yugoslav International Cultural Policy found it fruitful to broaden the selection of music genres and to include in its offer the ensembles and singers that perform Yugoslav version of popular music, so-called Zabavna Musica, grounding on a blend of Italian, French and American models. Throughout 1960s, 70s and 80s, some of the most famous Yugoslav singers and bands toured around the countries of Eastern Bloc, usually for months. The selection of host countries and musicians was based on the estimation of mass appeal and affirmative reception, as well as the local music production and its gaps. As a researcher Anna Petrov observed, the Soviet Union favored Yugoslav pop, Poland the new wave, and Bulgaria and Romania the folk or pop folk stars, and Yugoslav officials responded correspondingly to the demand. Although we are still missing answers on how these tours of Yugoslav pop rock and pop folk musicians affected the taste and consumption patterns of people inside uh, Iron Curtain and uh, the music scenes of specific countries, what seems indisputable is that they depicted Yugoslavia as the West to the Eastern Bloc, as a place for developed music industry, diversity of music styles, talented musicians and open-minded Communist Party officials. Not less important is the fact that Yugoslav tours served to mediate the major trends in global music industry to the population of Eastern Bloc that were under heavy restrictions regarding traveling abroad and obtaining foreign cultural products. After the breakup of Yugoslavia, Serbian cultural spheres, uh, as well as sphere of cultural diplomacy, undergone a tour of transformation due to a number of factors. The fragmentation of once large music market, the dismantling of successful and powerful music industry, the widespread, uh, widespread illegal copying uh, of music products, economic, cultural and political isolation during Milosevic's rule, the political instability in post-Milosevic era, ambiguous cultural identity and oscillating international relations. While during the first decade of the 21st century with the global expansion of the world music genre, uh, Serbian cultural policymakers could rely on the local traditional folk music heritage and a number of experienced and young uh, musicians willing to enact Balkan sound and present it to the domestic and foreign audience. After 2012, finding the steady course both in national and international frameworks turned out as challenging. With the constant rise of influence of populist approach to culture, cultural sphere that similarly to the 1990s becomes manifest in the programming of media with national coverage, and at the same time non-existence of clearly defined strategy of cultural diplomacy, but also vaguely constructed cultural identity, not to mention the profound cultural and socio-political shifts brought by expansion of digital media and social networks, pandemic of COVID-19 and recently the war in Ukraine, uh, it seems that Serbia needs to continue its search for a viable path in international cultural promotion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you, your uh, presentation was really interesting and I think there are many dimensions that we can debate later on if we are going to have a time. But yeah. now I would like to give a word to Jelena Todorovic and Bilana Zervenkovic. Um, 
uh, Jelena Todorovic is a full professor of early modern European culture at the Faculty of Fine Arts, University of the Arts in Belgrade, the Vice Dean for International Cooperation. Since 2006, she runs the project of the State Art Collection in Belgrade, uh, the work for which she received European Union Award for Cultural Heritage in 2018. Although an art historian by training, her interests have always been more directed towards early modern cultural history, as well as the curatorial work and the history of collecting in the first half of 20th century. Important publications include Spazi Delusione, then the realms of eternal present, the hidden legacy of Baroque culture in modern literature, then a catalog Državne umetničke kolekcije Dvorskog kompleksa, etc., etc. She's widely published in Yugoslavia and abroad. Videna Crvenković received her MA at the Faculty of Philosophy in History of Art Department. She began her career as curator of the art collection at the Royal Compound in 2006. From 2008, she was involved in the systematization and research of the State Art Collection Project at the Royal Compound, supported by the Ministry of Culture. As a curator, she organized many exhibitions at the Royal Compound referring to the art collections. Since 2012, she joined the Museum of Applied Art in Belgrade as a curator in charge for the Department of Fort Ceramics, Porcelain and Glass. From 2014, she participates regularly to the regional and international projects and symposiums. So please, Jelena and Bilena, present us the your paper, Arcadian and Yugoslav, Building Symbolic Cultural Identity in the case of the State Art Collection of Yugoslavia. We just heard, by the way, on today's keynote speaker, that uh, for the first time, the complete collection of artworks throughout Serbian embassies is going to be finally digitalized. Okay, this is not a real collection, it's a kind of a collection of collections, but uh, we just see to what extent this um, job that you were doing on the Royal Compound uh, is uh, so important. Please, Elena, take the floor and Bilena, however, you made agreement which one is going to be the first. Thank you so much, Professor Šašić, for this wonderful introduction. Can I be heard? Yes, perfect. Okay, at last. <laughs> so uh, I would like also to say that uh, we've heard many really inspiring presentations throughout these two days and this morning's keynote, uh, which showed us how many uh, and how diverse are facets of the cultural diplomacy. However, very few people mentioned uh, the role of the collections and collecting in the cultural diplomacy of the state. And this tradition of collecting uh, as a form of symbolic state identity, as a form of symbolic ideology of the state goes uh, really centuries behind, goes to first wunderkammers, first cabinets of curiosities, whose role was not only to give the image of the microcosm of the world, to present basically the entire universe in one closet shot, as so uh, well described one traveler, the cabinet of curiosities of John Tredeskant, but they were also to be the mirrors the symbolic reflections of their owners, of their collectors, whether the collector was in an individual or in our case, uh, the state. The idea that works of art can actually give a symbolic portrait of the one who created the collection also can be found in collection of the first Habsburgs, in the collections of the Medici, in the collection, of course, of the first public museums, uh, think of Louvre or the British Museum. But it's really our task today to present to you how a, a state art collection can be 
really the imaginary and symbolic portrait of this public entity. It is always the case with the museums, and that we are going to hear in the most interesting panel this afternoon, where we have our dear colleague, uh, Tiana Palkovich Bugarski. But we want to present you a different case, a very specific collection, which was created uh, at the moment the country we talked a lot about this morning was created, and that is Yugoslavia, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in 1929. And it served as a symbolic alter ego of different Yugoslavias from 1929 until 1980s, when the last work of art was added to the collection. This collection uh, was not envisaged as a museum. It was envisaged as a collection to be presented in one of the main seas of power, the new uh, courts of power in Belgrade, built by King Alexander and finished by Prince Paul. Uh, in front of you, you have the so-called Old Palace, and this is the White Palace, both in the Royal Compound in Belgrade. This collection grew from 1929 until 1980, and we will see who were the people responsible for its uh, basically creation, who were responsible for its growth, and even most importantly, who was responsible for the main concepts that underpinned the cultural diplomacy expressed through this specific collection. When I say specific, uh, it was not done with the concept of a museum. So no chronological, no stylistic background was used to form this collection, but actually the ideas which also underpinned the symbolic portrait of the newly created state. And we will see uh, both through my talk and uh, the continuation by my colleague, Biljana Cervenkovic, how the ideas of the European and the Yugoslav, of the Arcadian, uh, harmonious and Yugoslav would be present throughout its history. But uh, I want to show you simply a few images how the same space of power was used as a ceremonial space of the state from 1936 and he, here we see it in 1966 and we see it actually today because when we have some very important state events they're also taking place in this particular ceremonial space. But to go back to the founding of this collection uh, it was of course uh, started by the ruler of the state, who was the King Alexander of Yugoslavia, but actually uh, it was uh, formed, it was uh, created, and the majority of works were actually chosen uh, by Prince Paul, uh, his cousin because uh, there, was, there were no better person at that moment in Yugoslavia to be responsible for the creation of the state art collection. Because Prince Paul, educated in Oxford, a great connoisseur and collector himself, actually invested all of his knowledge, but more importantly, all of his most powerful connections to gather the works which would form the state art collection we have today. And when I say most powerful connections, we have to bear in mind that uh, not only he was a friend of Kenneth Clark, uh, one of the most famous art historians of the time, also the director uh, of the National Gallery and the celebrated uh, director of the Ashmolean Museum, the creator of the Serious Civilization, but uh, two people who defined the art world at the moment. One was Bernard Berenson, also called the Patriarch of the Renaissance, and really the prince of the dealers, the most celebrated, the richest, and really the most influential dealer of the day, Joseph Devine. Bernard Berenson on your left, Joseph Devine on your right. And they were people through whom some of the most important works for this collection uh, were gathered, were acquired, but also uh, the collection from its very beginning uh, had really two major paths. One was collection of uh, the most important works of the early modern uh, European art and collecting 
the celebrated artist of the newly founded country, Yugoslavia, of which more you will hear from my colleague. But when I say most important works of European art, the idea behind it was to show that newly founded state equally belongs to the time-honored cultural history of Europe, as well uh, as to the period of its most glorious development, which was, of course, the Renaissance, Baroque, and the Age of Enlightenment. And that was really the guiding idea behind forming the European part of the state art collection. And where we have such uh, really outstanding works as Nicolas Poussin's uh, uh, Arcadian Landscape with Three Monks or his um, Venus and Adonis, or we have uh, Nicolas Chapron and his uh, Arcadian Landscape with Muses. But something which I want to, uh, or Sébastien Baudon, to, to also uh, draw your attention to in connection with these particular um, heroic and idealistic and Arcadian landscapes of the French cla uh, Baroque classicism is that these paintings gave another idea which was in the core of the creating the symbolic portrait of Yugoslavia and that is the concept of Arcadia because each country from early modern times up to the present day actually wants to re reinstate, reconstruct and uh, renew the state of Arcadia with its uh, political visions. But also, uh, apart from the Arcadian visions, there was another vision built in uh, the European collection of the state art collection of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and continued further. And that was the idea of the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance as the crucible of European culture, Renaissance as the age of which uh, basically rediscovered classical ideals of harmony, the, the Renaissance as the reminder of also the Arcadia, which could be recreated in the early modern world. So that's why uh, the works like Francisque Mier, which is a Baroque classicist, stand next to some of the masterpieces of the European Renaissance, which is uh, Palma Vecchio, Palma Vecchio's Holy Family. And in that way, the idea was that the newly founded state not only strives to be the Arcadian vision, but also tries to reinstate in its politics, in its growth, the ideals of the Italian Renaissance and the Italian city-states. Just as a postscriptum of my part, before I invite uh, my colleague Biljana Cervenkovic to join, I just want to say that this concept of the Arcadian Renaissance vision didn't only was confined to the visual arts in the collection, but also to the decoration, to the entire interior decoration, because the entire interior decoration was given to one of the most influential, um, we can say interior, not only interior decorators, but uh, someone who really designed the style of the entire, entire building, which was the company Bernhard Ludwig, which designed everything from Hofburg uh, to uh, Rathaus in Vienna, but also to the palaces from Carinthia to Trieste. And his preferred style of the creation of European courts of the day was actually neo-Renaissance, which we hear, see uh, here on his drawing from the archive in Vienna, but also how it was executed in situ and actually his signature in the uh, lock or one of the doors. So on this point, I would like to ask my colleague to show you what was the other path of the cultural diplomacy seen through the state art collection of uh, ah. the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and later the Socialist Federative mm -hmm. Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, Milena, I'm closing okay. my presentation and I'm asking you to start yours. Okay, thank you, Ioana. Hello, everyone. And I will try to share my, my PowerPoint. <laughs> Super. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
just uh, as Yelena said, representative state government space are one of the most important mirrors of state ideology and uh, an ideal field for the creating the visual identity of the state. Art uh, has a key role in this process. The creation of a common state of the kingdom of the Yugoslavia and idea of Yugoslavism were uh, the basis of the complex context of the formation of the state identity, which was primarily reflected in the court or representative culture and art. The, uh, the permission of architecture, applied and fine arts, as well as synthesis of existing artistic uh, current uh, that uh, corresponded to the state's ambition ensured the success of the realization and the created, uh, of the created concept. The artistic tendency that arose from the political idea of integral Yugoslavism supported by the local elite and the state institution uh, was materialized in the works of the artists presented at the Royal and the White Palace. Sorry. The key factor of emphasizing uh, the Yugoslav idea of the court entity was the art of Ivan Nesterich. At the invitation of the king, he repeated his previous work of the Vidavdan Temple at the ceremonial space of the royal compound with the strong state symbols of integral Yugoslavism. The creation of Yugoslav identity implied a clearly defined line of European culture, so uh, the entry of art collection represented the state of Yugoslavia as a part of the European cultural space. The respiration of King Alexander Karadjerjevic uh, for the creation of virtual Yugoslav uh, tradition was reflected in Mestrovic visualization of the Yugoslav myth. Mestrovic created, uh, as you see, um, a sculpture uh, such as Milan Šovović, Prince Marko, Sphinx, History of Creations, and others of his work for the Royal Compound. Uh, the goal uh, to embody of the vision of the ideal state of Yugoslavia were, in addition to mythical characters, as a pantheon of Yugoslav <clears throat> artists embodied in portraits of uh, Peter Petrovich Nengos and Mestrovich himself. The structure of collection included uh, the presentation of life, uh, so the works such as a weaver of Matia, by ya Matija Yama or uh, the prominent Peter, by Peter Dobrovich um, were in that corpus. The formation of identity was uh, read through the gallery of uh, dynastic and king's portraits uh, to which the evil character of the ruler was built. After World War II, the construction of the new state identity was in the hands of economically and ideologically powerful state apparatus. The pluralism of the Federal State Communist parties required uh, the um, plain state instrumentalization of the past. Socialist realism in fine arts uh, was in the service of propagating a new soci social order. Implementation of the state culture policy and promote promotion of communal culture heritage uh, condition the purchase of the works uh, with uh, scenes from the National Liberation uh, War with uh, 
painting uh, also with landscape from various parts of the country, but also the works such as copies of frescoes um, uh, from medieval monastery by Rajko Nikolic. The works uh, such as uh, Vlaho Bukovac from the first decade of the 20th century, uh, as well as works uh, 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 by Nikola Martinovsky, Oskar Herman, Petr Milosavljevic, uh, Lubarda, etc. Unlike the previous state policy and ideology based on the idea of integral Yugoslavism, the idea of the one nation, even one a race post World War uh, uh, Second period upgrade of the art collection went uh, in the direction of creation and um, ideal image of community and um, image of ideal multicultural space. Um, uh, we, we and building the identity of ideal space of Yugoslav state. Uh, such a collection was uh, in the fun function uh, of communication, the space of highest political and the social sphere, where ideal field for this type of activity, addressing all observers, um, this art collection encouraged the reflection and at the same time promoted the social uh, cohesion and uh, 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 straightening uh, of international and uh, intercultural ties. It is uh, from, uh, it is for me. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for this excellent presentation of the, that we all can really see the symbolic importance of collection making for the representation of identity. And now we are going further up. I think it's uh, going to be uh, excellent now contribution from another side, Central European identity. Giacomo Pedin is the artistic director of the Nickel Fest and adjunct professor for theory of direction from, uh, and history of direction already of dramaturgy of scenic space, etc. He gained his PhD at the University of Pavia. His research topics are direction, drama, and in general, intersections between theater, performance, and writing in modern and contemporary ages, with a focus on front of the relations between theater and education and between theater and politics. Nowadays, he is deepening the relations between gaming and theater. At the same time, he's committed within the stage practice, working with leading Italian theatrical institutions as dramaturg, director, second director, artistic project manager. From 2017 till 19, he was dramaturg for Emilia Romagna Teatro Fondazione, Teatro Nazionale, where he collaborated with the artistic direction as coordinator and curator of cultural and publishing activities, educationals, and others linked to show productions. So please, Giacomo, you waited quite a long to present us your analysis of new intercultural practices in performing arts for Central Europe. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for this um, very interesting conference. I, uh, I'm so sorry that I heard only uh, the, um, the speeches of today because I'm quite busy in this moment for the other days. I'm sorry not to be in Belgrade where I, I hope to come again shortly as soon as I, as I, as I can. Uh, my uh, speech this morning will be um, a little bit more uh, practical, focusing on uh, an experience that is happening uh, nowadays, and in particular for the job I'm doing since the end of 2020 as artistic director of this particular kind of festival, a metal fest that is quite uh, close to the um, to what we heard 
before uh, the, the purpose of having festival as uh, um, a mean for, uh, for, cultural, for cultural diplomacy. Um, the history and the case of, of, of Middlefest uh, in, in the past, and in particular in its beginning, in its, the, the first phase of his history and uh, of its history and the condition uh, now, nowadays, uh, uh, especially in relation with uh, uh, other European projects uh, and uh, um, the, the, the system of network, network now, uh, can be quite um, relevant to see how um, the cultural diplomacy uh, towards festival uh, has changed and what kind of perspectives can be uh, can be at that moment. Uh, obviously, I will start with a, a brief consideration about the history of this kind of festival that is uh, quite particular in the uh, position uh, and the role of cultural festival in my in my country in in, in Italy and uh, in how Italy uh, at one point started to consider culture as a mean for cultural diplomacy and for diplomacy at all especially with the central area of Europe and the Balkans in particular um Middlefest was founded in uh, uh, 1991 uh, by not the uh, at that time Italian Ministry for Tourism and um, and Performing Arts, but by the Ministry, the Foreign Ministry. Uh, this is an an, exce an exception for my for my country, and uh, this is the sign of what this kind of festival was. It was an idea of uh, um, the minister of that time, Gianni De Michelis. Uh, uh, in order to um, build up a policy of relations uh, of Italy with uh, the, the countries of the center of Europe after the ending of the Cold War, War uh, the, Cold, uh, the Cold War in, uh, in 1989. Uh, so uh, they decided to make this festival in a region, Friuli Venezia Giulia, that is the region that now leads uh, really the festival uh, that is more under the region government than the national one, uh, a region that until the end of the Cold War was mainly a region of border, uh, um, full of military uh, in, in the border with, uh, with Yugoslavia, obviously. Uh, in 1991, the changing of the situation suggested uh, to build up a new uh, route for for uh, for for that region, and so um, the choice of uh, of the Italian Foreign Ministry was to build up this festival with a particular condition solution that was quite uncommon uh, at that time, and it's still uncommon for uh, for 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 uh, for Europe in general. The idea was to make a festival as a, 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 a real collaboration between Italy, Austria, Hungary, and obviously uh, Czechoslovakia at that time and Yugoslavia uh, at that time. With this particular um, organization, uh, to have uh, an artistic direction and organization, uh, uh, a managing direction from each country participant. So one from Italy, and uh, uh, the artistic director was Giorgio Presburger, one from Hungary, uh, and the artistic director appointed was Tomasz Hascher, one from Yugoslavia, and the artistic director appointed was Jovan Cirilov, uh, one from Czechoslo uh, Czechoslo <laughs> um, Czechoslovakia, <laughs> I, I say in, in Italy, I had some problems with English, uh, uh, and uh, the artistic director was uh, Yiri Menzel and uh, Georgi Tabori for Austria. It was quite uncommon to have five artistic directors and five important artistic um, figures at that time for five different countries for one project to be held in Italy. And uh, the decision of the place was also important. It was Civitale del Friuli, that is... Uh, a little town very, very close to now Slovenian borders at that time, Yugoslavian borders, uh, because it was, yeah, the beginning, the beginning of 1991. Uh, this system was intended also to use the festival as a real place of meetings. Uh, for the first year, the, um, the, 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 the presidency of the five republics involved were 
present during the festival. And uh, it was intended to be also uh, for the future. And it, it, it has been also for 1992, the very first two years. After um, this project uh, stopped, and mainly it stopped in 1993 because of the um, beginning of the war in the, in the West Balkans. Um, so the festival uh, wasn't made for that year. And that kind of project for cultural diplomacy stopped at all, and stopped also because in Italy the political situation changed in 1993. Uh, with the end of the so-called First Republic and, uh, uh, and the, the starting of the period of the Second Republic. So all the politicians that promoted that project uh, was out of, the, uh, of, their, of their role. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, the, the project at all and the idea of having a festival as a cultural diplomacy uh, mean didn't stop. Uh, the, the fact the, 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 the festival passed under the control, not of the state, but of the region. So uh, from 1994, it started again with the supervision and the control of Friuli Venezia Giulia region that is also a um, special region in Italy, as many regions uh, uh, close to the borders. Um, it changed the, the, the way of managing cultural diplomacy, obviously. Uh, it passed under the control of a regional government, not a state government. Uh, the presence of artists and, uh, um, and, uh, and, 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 and the politicians and people from abroad still uh, was a fact of middle of us, but not in the same dimension of the beginning. Uh, then the, 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 the needs of the festival came out and step by step the condition changed. Uh, so now, after 30 years of life, uh, the situation is really, really, really different at all. And uh, the, the practical chances uh, uh, for, for, for a festival with this particular aim of cultural diplomacy are quite different from that time. Because the, um, not having the, 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 the guide and the the, the, the leadership of, of, of the national state government, the function and the way of uh, making cultural diplomacy in a, in, a, in a festival linked to a regional government is quite, quite, uh, quite different. Uh, what I, um, uh, I would like to, uh, to say to you today are uh, some, some perspectives we are working on uh, that are obviously uh, inside the situation uh, we and the chances we have today. What uh, is changed from the beginning, from 30 years ago, is the system in which festivals are now. Uh, now there are many different networks in which it's possible to make connections and to work on cultural diplomacy. Uh, the, this is um, for, 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 for Mitterfest, obviously, but it's not only for Mitterfest, but also for other cultural institutions. I mean, also for theaters that I know for my uh, previous um, job ex experiences. For the case of Mitterfest, uh, um, one very important is obviously the European Festival Association. Uh, it was already uh, existing 30 years ago. Uh, but obviously it was quite different, the context and the function of a, of a, of a, of a network. Uh, the European Festival Association was born uh, 70 years ago. Mm, this year is the 70 year, uh, it's the 70th birthday. And, uh, uh, and it, it was born as a mm, music festival association. But nowadays the festival association, uh, the European Festival Association uh, is a system that, mm, that mm, brings together big festival, medium festival, like Metafesis, and a small festival, in order to make know each other from very different kind of uh, topics, because uh, some of them are performing festival, Metafesis are performing arts festival for music, theater, and, and dance, and circus, but there are also literary festival and with other, other topics. But the question is that IFA uh, is not only a network of festival, but also a network of national organization of festival at the same time. So the context of relations is uh, in, in some way deeper than before uh, right now. Uh, 
maybe at the same time, I can say that it's quite full of chances. Um, if I confront with the beginning of this festival, there was a lack of networks. Now we are full of networks and full of association. For example, if I consider the case of IFA in relation to Metafest, Metafest is uh, uh, an associated festival to IFA, but at the same time, the Italian Association of Festival, our national association, which Metafest is uh, obviously a part, is part of IFA itself. Uh, for, for Serbia, for example, the Serbian Festival Association is part of, uh, of IFA, but some Serbian festival are inside IFA uh, at, the same, at the same time. This is the context. So uh, what does it mean working for a festival in a cultural diplomacy way? Um, there are some lines. I will uh, tell you about uh, some of them. One line uh, nowadays very important uh, um, that is related to also to uh, the new way of funding that is not only a question of funding, it's also a question of relations, are the co-production system. Um, now it is more common to find uh, ways of collaboration between festival in order to uh, bring relations between artists uh, uh, towards uh, towards co-production of projects. So, if in the past it was uh, most com more more common that a performance could be produced just by one producer, that could be a theater or a, a, a music theater or uh, or uh, or another or a festival. Uh, now we are working like several festival does. Uh, the, like several festivals do, uh, in, uh, in co-productions. Uh, the co-production is not only a question of putting together an amount of uh, financial resources in order to work together, but it's also a name to uh, realize a uh, material and physical connection between artists, at the same time also presenting it uh, to not only to the audience, but all, also to the uh, cultural and political relations. Uh, for example, uh, I can um, I can consider what we done uh, one year ago, in which my festival, in a, uh, in a, a common decision with the um, regional government, decided to focus on Slovenia, for example, for um, uh, for another uh, reason that I will uh, uh, tell you about in a minute. Uh, we decided to make a collaboration, a strong collaboration for a new production between Mitterfest and the Ljubljana Festival, another important historical festival uh, for, for, for Slovenia now, but in the past for Yugoslavia. And uh, um, it was also linked to the fact that during the festival uh, was organized by another partner, a uh, forum, uh, uh, a series of talk about the collaboration between Italy and Slovenia nowadays. At the same time, it was linked also in having the uh, um, president of the Republic of Slovenia during the opening ceremony of the festival. So uh, what we do with co-productions and with artists is also linked uh, with the diplomatic discussions and meetings. Obviously, that production had Italian artists with a Slovenian artist. That's the other point, making artists encounter together, or sometimes uh, maybe making also the performances going around uh, several countries. Last year, we made with uh, um, with the Netherlands, for example, um, uh, inside of a strategy for Midfest uh, of having relations with. Uh, 27 different European countries, not only countries inside the UE, uh, EU, sorry, EU, obviously, but uh, inside the continent in general. There are several, obviously, there are several uh, countries from the West Balkans. In this sense, uh, it's also what we do, maybe uh, also with the uh, education uh, institutions. Uh, the Music Academy of Trieste has a program with uh, uh, Novi Sad and, uh, and, uh, and Belgrade. And last year and this year, they will play together with Italian and Serbian musicians before a little tour in, also in Serbia. 
uh, this is also a promoting of a co-production. This is not a co-production of Metalfest, but of the Music Academy of Trieste. But we help the, uh, the, the, the project in order to put inside an important, an important festival for the premiere. Uh, this is a way, and obviously, um, this is a, a, a way in this moment for, 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 for the region of Middlefest linked to an important other uh, moment of, co of cultural diplomacy that will be in, in, um, uh, 20, in 2025 uh, the uh, sharing of the capital of the European capital of culture, be culture between Nova Gorica in Slovenia and with the collaboration of Gorizia in Italy. And uh, Mitafest is really close to, uh, to, to Gorizia. And for this reason, we started to have with the institution of uh, Nova Gorica, European Capital of Culture, Go 2025, we started to make one project together every year. Uh, this is another way to promote uh, the collaboration with, between two, uh, two countries. Uh, and at the same time, uh, with a strategy of cultural diplomacy, choosing uh, a state or a couple of states every year for a focus that it means uh, a focus for art, collaboration between artists of different countries, and a focus of, uh, of discussion and meetings at UFESA. This year is Austria mainly, and uh, uh, with Switzerland, then we will go uh, next year, uh, we will go in Hungary uh, following the next European capital of the country, that will be Vesprem. Um, this year, this year there is also not 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 no visa and um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and also for this reason we have this collaboration with the music music academy. Um, these are some lines on new perspective of um, having art as a part of cultural diplomacy, linking the art production, the art distribution uh, with. Uh, with the promoting of cultural encounters. Another uh, line, uh, quite important, that I want to present to you, uh, because is a line um, that several festivals and uh, theaters are making right now. Uh, we decided to make one, 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 one specific project, is the line about new artists, new generation. Uh, what happened? After the the end of the Cold War and uh, and uh, and going down of the uh, of the Iron Curtain was also in the West, in the East, in the Central Europe, uh, a new way of uh, having uh, young artists uh, in Europe. Um, many young artists um, travel; uh, they travel to study. Uh, they 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 start to work often not in the, in, in the country they they are from and they they study so the geography of young artists is quite different nowadays from it was uh 30 years ago in this sense we uh, studied la sia project that is called metal young that is an artistic project with a strong um, cultural diplomacy consequences Mittal Young project is uh, a project that works in this way. Um, during the year, there's an open call for young artists under 30 years old of theater, music, and dance. They can send uh, a proposal to uh, have one show of them host during a pre-festival called Mittal Young. Uh, Middle Fest is a festival made at the end of July. This year, it's going to be from the 22nd to the 31st of July. Mittal Young is held in May. When they send a proposal, we can receive proposal from artists in 20, 27 different countries of the Central Europe and the Balkans mostly. Um, and this year we received 150 propo proposals. Uh, the proposals are, uh, are evaluated by a committee of under 30 curators, so not by me, but, but young people. This committee is an international committee. So this is another chance to make up relations. Mainly are people from, from, from Italy, also a little part from Austria, from Slovenia, and the previous winner of the Mittal Young. For this year, it means Germany and Czech Republic. 
So this system is a meeting between young people, uh, making them being together during this pre-festival in May, in which nine performances are held and three of them are chosen to be get, get back to the main festival in July. This is an approach in order to encourage the connections and the, 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 the discussion of young generation between, um, between them, each other, inside an institutional uh, an institution like Mittelfest is, and also to see what is the uh, kind of uh, uh, cultural relations uh, of new, of young students and artists uh, in, uh, in Europe nowadays, uh, um, considering uh, uh, also uh, this project and culture as a mean to understand the changings of our, uh, of our artistic and cultural, and cultural panorama. Uh, for this reason, this project this year has a collaboration for music with the Karintija Zomer Music Festival that is in, in Austria and for theater with uh, uh, National Theater of Novogorica, always with for the capital European culture, with the idea of developing this uh, system of relation in the next years, opening to other 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 countries, other countries. And uh, step by step, it can be another mean for uh, relations, for cultural, uh, cultural diplomacy, uh, starting from young people and then uh, having relations between institutions. All, obviously, this project to be done, um, it needs uh, a, a deep relation of Metafest with academies, uh, all around uh, uh, the 27 European countries considered. So we have relation with uh, European academies, I mean, from Bulgaria <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 to Poland, uh, in order to give you the, the dimension. This, uh, I think, quite, quite important as a, a, as a, as a chance to, uh, to uh, build up and to make uh, also cultural relations and diplomacy, not from the top, but also from, uh, from, from the below. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think that your contribution was also challenging. Um, now we have a few moments for a discussion. If you would like to, any of you to open discussion. If not, I have just one uh, suggestion. In fact, um, I have to uh, sometimes to watch uh, here, sometimes back there and so on. But um, exactly for, for Giacomo Pedini. Uh, in the 80s, when I was like, let's say, starting my career and so on, we really liked the idea of Alte Adria, although we felt already in that moment that it's separating Yugoslavia. So it was prior to that. I personally participated in numerous colloquia in, throughout the Austria and Italy uh, about Middle Europa, meaning of Middle Europa and so on. And we from Belgrade, we also felt to be part of Middle Europa. But this idea, at the same time, helped a lot. This falling of the Berlin Wall gave self-confidence to Polish, Czech, Slovaks, uh, Hungarian, first of all, uh, intellectuals and artists, let's say more or less uh, Slovenian, Croatian, uh, had that self-confidence, but also it happened later on that they used this idea exactly to separate from uh, Yugoslavia. So my question would be, uh, because you are very often mentioned in 27 countries, are uh, those 27 countries today incorporating Romania, which definitely part of Romania belong to the idea of the cultural corpus of Middle Europa, Ukraine too, or 
the 80s, the division and selection that started in the 80s of Middle Europa, making new borders toward Eastern Europe, is partially also the root of the problem that Ukraine and Belarus has rejected at the beginning from Middle European cultural space are having today. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And um, uh, the, the path of Mittelfest about cultural diplomacy, uh, and I forgot to say this, uh, was also linked to the history of INCHE, the Central Inici Initiative Europe. Uh, that nowadays is without Austria, but uh, it's with a lot of countries from from the Balkans and from and from the, and from the also the Central East of Europe. For example, Ukraine is part as it's part, um, uh, 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 and for this reason, uh, when I say twenty-seven countries, I consider also Ukraine. I consider also Romania. I consider also Mo Moldavia. And I consider also Belarus uh, and uh, also the Baltic states, also the Baltic states. Um, in, uh, to be honest, what we decided to do in order to uh, enhance the, the, the empower, the, the cultural diplomacy and the relation, we tried to extend the countries from the beginning, getting some countries more in the East, especially in the Northeast, so the Baltics, and also a little bit in the West, going until Belgium and Switzerland in South. So the focus at the beginning was Middle Europe. Uh, we open a bit uh, in order to empower the, the relation, uh, taking out the Western, Western Europe. Uh, so Western Europe is out, but um, the, 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 East, the, the East of Europe, uh, obviously, obviously, uh, uh, I think, especially in this moment, um, if I consider the moment in which countries can be divided, it happens. This is a matter of politics more than uh, uh, more than cultural, maybe. But we uh, always work for relations. Uh, for example, this year we decided to do before the starting of the of the war in Ukraine to have a concert between a Ukrainian artist and a Russian artist. Decided to do several months ago because the program is decided at the end of the year before. So the program of this year was made at the end of 2021. But we are keeping to do it. That is not, um, is not uh, immediate to, to, to do it and to say it because uh, it happened in some cultural institutions, the decision to not work with Russian artists, for, for example. Russia is not a, a, a country of, uh, of our program uh, in general, but it can happen to have artists from, uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, close countries. And we go on also because the, the mission of Mittelfest is uh, promoting uh, meetings, uh, starting from artists. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone who would like to comment or to ask of, of any of the presentations because all are there, so interesting and uh, so important? But if not, I'm not going to insist. Uh, there was a question about PowerPoint. I would personally like to have all PowerPoints of uh, all of you that presented. So whoever likes to share, you might share it to organizers and then we can uh, uh, distribute it further. And uh, I have, yes, Elena, you want to say something? brief question for you note when you talked about the legacy of non-aligned movement there is also to consider a, con a quite a substantial art collection which originated from the state gifts which uh, uh, mm -hmm. they are of, of course the part of the museum of history of yugoslavia and uh, that is that also makes up the entire uh, mosaics of the different 
elements of cultural diplomacy being connected with this important movement? No, no, definitely. Uh, that was not, I just for the sake of time limited. Of course, no, I'm just saying it's, it's really, really amazing. And on collection, which is a little bit underestimated in Podgorica, because in fact, it was so hybrid collection that in the time, no Belgrade Museum wanted to accept it. So they sent this collection to Podgorica to create museum gallery of non-aligned countries. Then even in Podgorica, people in the 90s really want to distantiate it of legacy of non-alignment. So they, they just integrated, put in the depot this collection of the Gallery of Contemporary Arts. So it's only now that small studies about this collection are started. And I have to admit, as presence, you know, there is no curatorial decision behind. It might be everything, but it's up to us to really give, uh, to, to try to understand it and to give meaning. And sometimes I will just use this opportunity to say how those gifts are important. When I brought only catalog of the Museum of Yugoslavia of so-called royal gifts, but among these royal gifts were the gifts of King Sihanouk to Tito. These kind of pieces of, uh, traditional silverware in contemporary design cannot be found anywhere in Cambodia. Those people who were skillful were killed during Khmer Rouge regime. Everything that was artifacts, cultural artifacts has been destroyed. Even personal photo albums, everything was destroyed. And for all of them that I have shown and shared this PDF, because it was in PDF, they said we never knew that our culture was capable in 50s to produce such a kind of sophisticated artifact because today we are not capable to produce it. Now they're just learning back the traditional craft, the craft from 19th century. That's, that's, but that this craft could be designed and shaped in a contemporary design they never thought and that they did have that skill. So you see, sometimes collections might help back uh, the country from where things are coming and so on. And collections might be very inspirational, like Kento uh, textile from Ghana to inspire our contemporary fashion designers and so on. Uh, before, for example, Black Lives Matters, where this kind of fabric started to be used in the United States as a symbol of uh, joining the movement, uh, Black Lives Matters, this kind of fashions and so on. So it's interesting. Collections are really, and in fact, thank you, because now I think I'm going even to focus much more on collections from non-aligned period. Wonderful. And uh, for me, it was, it was a good remark in chat, which is true that the part of this non-aligned museum uh, is uh, the part of the collection is used for the Montenegrin Biennale this year. And it's done yeah, by yeah, Natasha Kralievich. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, that's just, that's why I said it started to be taken on the surface, it's not- uh... You know, I know about the museum. I've never been able to see the artifacts. Yeah, because they were in depot most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, our time is expired. And I thank you really very, very much for all of your presentations. Whoever wants to share, do share with us. And then people who address us for presentation, we will send them for personal use, of course, not for, for misuse and so on, but we are all academics and we are curious to have all these informations and really all the presentations have been very, very important. Thank you very much. And 
I hope see you, some of you at 2.30, we will have three different panels, out of whom really all three very interesting. So I will have to choose where I will go, but uh, I, I would say enhance all of you to join at least one of them or to skip, go jump from one to another in the time. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.